Hello Frizzle Forum. I absolutely love the Dresden Files series, and I would be overjoyed for it to get its own movie series. Now, it did already get its own TV series way back when, but that wasn't very good, and I'll discuss that more at the end. This video is supposed to be how would I adapt the Dresden Files? What should be changed from the books to make an even better movie or TV show? What should stay the same? And what are the important bits here? Here are my goals of this project. First is to make it better. Um, the Dresden Files books are not perfect, so we can get them a little bit more close to perfection. I think particularly the first few books, you can point to various plot things and thematic things that don't always line up and are always cohesive. That is one of the reasons that this series has the reputation of it gets better in the later books, I swear. But I still think the first book, Stormfront, can make a fantastic movie if we just improve it a little bit. My next goal of this movie pitch is to slim it down. You might notice I said movie and not TV show. Let me justify that decision. I know, I know, all the rage right now is adapting things into TV shows, and I do think sometimes that is the right route to take, but I don't think it's the right route to take for Dresden Files. And I look at other adaptations, such as The Wheel of Time, which got a bunch of episodes and a bunch of time, and you know what that TV show did with all of its extra episodes and time? Gave us plot lines that didn't work and added in new things. So I worry so hard that if a creative team was given the liberty of adapting Stormfront into like an eight episode series, then it would become bloated and become worse. If instead we adapt it into a two hour movie, instead of bloating it up, we get to slim it down, which I think will produce a better result in the end. And the last goal is to make it have blockbuster potential. Because if we're making every single one of these books into a movie, that's like 25 movies by the time the series is done. And even if you didn't adapt all the books, that's still a lot of movies. So it has to be flawless, fantastic blockbuster vibes in order for it to get that much funding and support. But I do think there is enough potential in Dresden Files to become the next blockbuster chain like Marvel or Harry Potter. But the movies have to be so good and widely accessible for that to happen. So now let's break down exactly how I think Stormfront should be adapted beat by beat. We are going to be making some changes here because honestly, this YouTube video would be pretty boring if I just recounted this plot of Stormfront. So I'm going to justify every single one of those changes and why I think it would make a better movie as we go. Here's our timeline for the movie. The movie is split into a few different subplots as follows. Miscellaneous whatevers. Morgan, etc. The police investigation and Murphy. Susan and general feelings. And the Marcone slash Shadow Man plot. We open with Harry Dresden in his office slash lab slash apartment chatting with Bob the Skull. Now, I know all you Supergroup fans are about to say, but doesn't that mess up his threshold if he has his office in the same place as his apartment? I know you'll say that because I too am a super fan and that's what I thought at first. But one, we're trying to slim it down here, guys, and there are too many locations that belong to Harry Dresden. We can just collapse them all into one. And also, it means that future plot points that I have planned out here will work better if they're the same location, okay? And this is just one decision that I'm just gonna make in the pursuit of blockbuster potential that the magic system in the movies is going to be softer than the magic system in the books. The magic system in the books is a relatively hard magic system with defined rules and limitations. But I think movies generally don't work as well as books do with hard magic systems. We can see this in, for example, Harry Potter, where in the books, the magic system is relatively hard. You have certain spells, you have to do certain incantations and certain things, and then you get specific results. But in the movies, you can just kind of wave your wand around and shoot lightning at each other. And that is cool from a spectacle side. And I think what makes a hard magic system in a book so appealing is that you can feel like you are mastering the magic as you learn the rules and get to know the system. But in a movie, it's harder to convey the rules of magic anyway without long exposition dumps, which I think are more annoying in movies than it is in books. So the magic system in the movies is just gonna be softer and uh, the threshold rules, whatever. Like we don't even have to worry about those. So Harry is with Bob in his office slash lab slash apartment, of course, complaining about the lack of money that they're behind on rent. And Bob is like, you know what we could do? We could get your love life on track if you just make a little love potion. And Harry is like, hold up, Bob, stop it. And in this way, we get to establish Bob's 
personality, their dynamic, and they can start having a conversation about the morality of a love potion, which is going to be the ongoing theme of this book, is Harry trying not to dabble in dark magic even though he's tempted. So he's going to be tempted by the idea of a love potion, but say, Bob, I'm trying to do better with my magic. But then Harry and Bob are interrupted by a phone call from Lieutenant Murphy, head of special investigations. She's calling him in because they've got some suspicious murder victims. And there we have two bodies, Tommy Tom and Jennifer, who are known slash suspected by the cops to work for the outfit of gentleman Johnny Marcone, the crime boss of Chicago. But the question that Lieutenant Murphy really wants answered from Harry Dresden, wizard, is what would someone need to do this spell to rip their hearts out of their chests? And Harry is reluctant to answer this question because he knows that in order to answer it, he would have to research black magic. And as we just established in the past scene, that's something he's trying to distance himself from. But he's strapped for cash and Murphy begs. So Harry reluctantly says, okay, I'll do it for you. And Murphy mentions offhand that Tommy Tom was one of the suspected leaders in the three eye drug ring. And Harry, of course, is very interested in this tidbit because he heard a rumor about this three eye drug and it gives you like the third sight, which is a magical wizard thing and not for pesky mortals to interfere with. But Murphy quickly shoves him off and is like, no, don't worry your pretty little head about that. I will take care of the drug side. You get me that research about this spell. And Harry promises, no, I'm not gonna look into it. Murphy calls him because that's an obvious lie but they leave cordial. This is also the part where Harry makes his guess that the killer who ripped the hearts out of these two people must be a woman. Because obviously a lot of hate went into this spell and only women can channel their hate so effectively. No, 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 no. I know what you're thinking. Chloe, why do we have to hold on to the sexist ideas of Harry Dresden? And I would answer that I think the sexism of Harry Dresden is an interesting theme and force in this book series and I don't want to get rid of it completely. And one of these days I'll make a video explaining more about my thoughts on that topic and I'll link it down in the footnotes when I do. But for now, just know that I love to hate the sexism of Harry Dresden and I do think it makes these books richer. So I don't want to get rid of it completely. However, we are aiming for blockbuster potential here. So the movie cannot be sexist. However, Harry Dresden himself can be sexist so long as we make sure it is known that this is a character flaw that he's working through and overcoming and we give him a character arc to do that. And then the movie becomes feminist, which is definitely blockbuster potential and I think will make a stronger story anyway. Because honestly, the character flaw of Harry Dresden being sexist in this book is kind of sometimes applied haphazardly and makes the book sexist instead of it just being a character flaw. So it's not always well executed in the books, but I think we can execute it well in the movie. And one of the ways we're going to make that improvement is by having Harry be pretty sure of this hunch that it's a woman. In the book Stormfront, he mentions this theory and then within a few scenes, he's referring to the killer as a he anyway. So it doesn't really go anywhere. But this plotline is going to go somewhere. So just keep that in the back of your mind throughout this entire plot we're gonna lay out that Harry Dresden is referring to the killer as a she. Now, as Harry is leaving the murder scene, he gets strong-armed into the car of Johnny Marcone, aforementioned Chicago drug lord. And Marcone tries to bribe him into not helping out the police and investigating this murder of his people because he doesn't want the police getting their grubby hands all over this case. And Harry turns him down, one, because he's trying to stick with his principles, but two, because he knows that this beginning of accepting money from a crime boss will likely lead to him using dark magic. And as established previously, he is trying to separate himself from that, even though he is tempted by the money. But he decides not to, and as he is leaving, he stares Marcone down, and we get the trigger of the soul gaze between them, where they look into the deepest, darkest secrets of each other and take each other's measure. And Harry is incredibly intimidated by the cold ruthlessness of Marcone's soul. And this will be the beginning of their wonderful banter relationship, which I'll talk more about later. Harry, still shaken from his encounter with Marcone's inner soul, goes to his happy place. Max, the pub where all the magical people hang out. While he is there, he chats up the bartender, Mac, who is as quiet and stoic as he is in the books. And Harry, still curious about the three eye that Murphy was mentioning, asks Mac what he's heard about it on the street. And Mac says that he's heard that there might actually be some real magic in this 
magical drug and that he suspects it might be being manufactured in this one area because he's heard rumors of dark magic picking up in that area. Susan Rodriguez, one of my favorite characters, reporter for the supernatural tabloid The Arcane, shows up and starts flirting with Harry and trying to ask him questions and about this murder scene he just went to and won't he just give her a little quote please? And Harry tries not to tell her anything but also you can tell that he kind of wants her help on this case because he knows how awesome of an ace reporter she is. They mention that they've already soul gazed and taken each other's measure, which is part of why they're so close to each other. And after a little bit more cajoling, Harry agrees to take Susan along as he goes and gathers information about the three eye drug being produced, maybe out on the waterfront. Now, from here on out, Susan is going to be Harry's sidekick for the majority of the scenes in this movie. And this solves several problems in this plot. One, it gives someone for Harry to talk to. The fun of these books is that he has a lot of interesting and witty internal banter, but that's internal. And for a movie, we have to make it external somehow. So we can either do like a voiceover, which is sometimes tacky and hard to pull off, or we can give him a sidekick that stays with him for a lot of scenes. This also contributes to solving the problem of this movie being called sexist because Susan's going to be such an awesome member of this team and so contributes to our feminist theming instead. And Susan can also have a few moments when Harry is referring to the killer as a she and she can be like, or he, just to make sure that the audience knows that Harry isn't necessarily right with jumping to this conclusion. So they go out to the lakefront and Harry summons local spirit, Toot Toot, to ask him questions about this rumored uptake in dark magic in the area. And Susan can also help out in this situation by using her question reporter skills to better cajole Toot Toot into the right avenue of answers. They learn from Toot Toot that there is a suspicious uptake in black magic in the area, and it's due to this group of people that is often having orgies and ordering pizza. Of course, the fairy has more information about the pizza than anything else. Toot Toot gives them the address. They go to a pretty abandoned looking lake house where there's obvious like remnants of magic circles and shady things going on, but it does look like it's been abandoned for at least a few days. While he's there, Harry picks up some various trinkets, including a scorpion pendant. And of course, Morgan, our favorite bully from the White Council of Wizards appears and is like, Harry Dresden, how dare you be flirting with breaking the laws of magic? I know you're the one who killed all those people by ripping out their hearts. And I'm watching you. You know, doing the typical Morgan stuff. And this is also where we get the exposition that Harry has killed someone with magic before. And because of that, he is a prime suspect for this. And also in high risk of going to the dark side because he has been there. Before. And Morgan tells Harry that the council will be convening to convict someone of this magical murder and Harry is now the prime suspect. So then we get the deadline because if Harry doesn't come up with a better suspect, he's the one who's going to be going down for these murders in the wizard courts. Pursuing the clue about them ordering pizza, Harry and Susan canvass the local pizza delivery places and they're able to talk to the delivery driver and they do discover that someone named Linda has been semi-regularly ordering pizza to that house for the past few months. So they now have Linda's phone number and Harry knows that she's involved somehow and his gut says that she is probably the killer because they're looking for a woman killer, right? Him and Susan decide to call in a night and make plans for the next evening to get together again. As Harry arrives home, lurking in the shadows for him is a thug with a baseball bat who beats him with it and reminds him that Johnny Marcone told him to not get involved in this case. So he better cut it out or bad things will happen. And then Harry, dejected, goes into his house and complains to Bob about how impossible this situation is because he has to investigate it now because if he doesn't come up with a better culprit, he's going down for this murder. Now, in the book, Marcone is not the one behind Three Eye or the murders. He's barely tangentially connected to it, which is why it doesn't make that much sense that he's trying to scare Harry off from investigating so hard. So in my version, in an effort to both simplify the plot and to make it a little bit more compelling, we are going to say that Marcone is the one behind the Three Eye. He's not directly the production team making it, but it is under the umbrella of his organization. Murphy calls Harry to check in asking, hey, have you done that research yet to tell me what someone would need to do in order to rip out someone else's heart with magic? And Harry tries his best to hide the fact that instead of pursuing that lead, he was pursuing leads about the three eye, which she told him not to, but of course she sees through him because she can tell when he's lying. And Murphy reminds him that the clues she needs are the ones about the spell and could he please get on it? And Harry is again reluctant, but 
again agrees, yes, yes, I'll have you the information by tomorrow morning, I'll get it done, because he knows that he needs another lead as well. Harry tries to sleep, but is too worried to do it, so instead he kills time by making potions with Bob. He wants an escape potion because he's starting to really worry about the White Council coming after him, and he might have to escape in a hurry if that happens. In the book, I think he wants this escape potion more for escaping Bianca the Vampire, but we're cutting out her whole subplot. Again, slimming it down, and she does not need to be in this story. And Bob strong arms Harry into making a love potion as well, saying that he's not going to help him with the skate potion unless he makes the love potion, etc. It plays out like it does in the books. And he pulls an all-nighter making potions and researching what it would take to rip out someone's heart for Murphy. In the morning, he calls Linda and gets her to agree to meet with him that evening to discuss the murder of her acquaintances. And Harry is fully planning during this meeting to take her down and have a confrontation with this powerful wizard that he suspects her to be. Which is why he really doesn't want to get Murphy involved, because he's worried about her and all the other police officers getting hurt in this showdown. Yes, he is scheduling this for the same time as his appointment later with Susan, but he doesn't realize it. He's kind of sleep deprived at the time and very stressed. So bright and early, Harry goes down to the station to report to Murphy the things he found that the spell would take an enormous amount of power and he doesn't know how any one person could handle it, so maybe they're looking for a team of wizards? Yeah, good luck with that. Also, at the police station, he runs into a person high on 3i and gets further confirmation that yes, this is a real magical drug and definitely someone who is magically powerful is manufacturing it. I realized that I missed a sticky note here. One second. Harry, suffering from a combination of staying up all night and getting a concussion from that baseball bat yesterday, starts collapsing in Murphy's office, and she kindly takes him home where he sleeps for many, many hours. Susan shows up at the appointed time for their date. Harry is sleeping, and he quickly says, wait, 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 let me, let me jump in the shower, and then we'll go out on our investigative adventure date together. And this plays out almost identically to the iconic scene in the book, where as he's in the shower, he hears something knocking at the door, and he suspects it is Linda, because he remembers suddenly that he also had an appointment with Linda at this time, and then it turns out instead to be a demon trying to kill them. He tells Susan to drink the escape potion, she accidentally drinks the love potion, they're trapped in a magic circle together, and she's trying to seduce him at the time, and that is not working for the magic circle and staying inside of this small circle, so then they have to break out and they take the escape potion together, they're out on the street, and it's the middle of a thunderstorm, and Harry calls down some lightning power and kills the demon. Everything that can go wrong, does go wrong. The only change I would make to this scene is that we can't have Harry naked for the whole thing. We are trying for blockbuster potential here, which does mean a PG-13 rating, so before he jumps out of the shower in a panic, he's at least going to put on like a pair of boxers. But other than that, the shampoo running into his eyes, the utter franticness of the whole exchange, keep it. I love this scene for how comically, ridiculously chaotic it is. Morgan shows up yet again, says, I knew you were consorting with demons, you evil black magic wizard you, I'm sure we're going to convict and execute you soon. And Morgan reminds Harry that justice to evil wizards is in the hands of the White Council, not the Chicago Police Department. And what does Harry think he's doing, consulting with the Chicago Police Department on a case about wizarding business? And Morgan pretty much tells Harry that if he continues to tell Murphy things, about the wizarding world, Morgan might just have to tie up the loose end of Murphy. And this will help us a scene later when Harry is pretty forcibly brought to the crime scene of dun 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 Linda, who has had her heart ripped out. So she's not the killer. Harry is surprised. And Murphy has found in Linda's apartment a note with Harry's name and number and address on it. And of course, Murphy is very suspicious about this and is asking Harry all these belligerent questions about what has he been doing really working on this case and how did he know this victim? But Harry, thinking about the threat that Morgan just made on Murphy's life, does not tell her anything, and she is very upset over this. Now this scene in the book, where Harry decides to stonewall Murphy, I think is a powerful scene. Because we've already seen earlier how close their friendship is, from her taking care of him and helping him get home when he was suffering from sleep deprivation and a concussion. We already know that these guys are good friends, so to have him purposely sabotage their friendship is such a juicy, angsty moment. But I do think in the book, he's lacking some motivation to do it because he isn't really hiding anything important from her in the book or have real motivation to do so. So in the movie, we will keep all the angst and add also 
a good motivation because Morgan is very into the jurisdiction of the White Council justice system, which I think fits in with his character. Harry leaves the crime scene very distressed. Susan picks him up and they have a wonderful heart to heart where Susan understandably asks him questions about this Morgan guy that keeps showing up and Harry explains that he's fallen to the dark side before and he's really worried, honestly, about being tempted by this dark magic of killing people. And even when he was killing the demon with the lightning, it felt so good. And if he did that to a human, that would be him going to the dark side, further reinforcing that theme and journey that we're having for him, of him not trusting himself. And this is also the point where Harry realizes that in order to get all the power to rip the hearts out of human body, the evil wizard must be using the storms. Harry gets jumped by a guy he recognizes as Marcone's enforcer. As established earlier when Harry was talking about the mechanics of the spell with Murphy, this is exactly the kind of link that the killer would need to rip the heart out of their victims. So Harry now knows that he is next and things just got even more real here, man. During the jumping and fight over his hair, Susan manages to claw Mr. Attacker and get a little bit of his blood under her fingernails, which Harry can then use to track him. This tracking spell leads the duo to the club of John Marcone. Harry is furious. He makes a dramatic entrance and almost goes for the immediate kill shot when he sees the guy who stole his hair, but barely holds himself back from the temptation. But in the ensuing confrontation, where Harry reveals that this guy stole his hair to John Marcone, Mr. Lackey is executed, which Harry feels bad about because he is a hero at heart who doesn't want to kill people. He's just tempted by the dark side. Harry and Marcone have a nice heart to heart where Harry is like, Marcone, why are you killing your people anyway? And Marcone is like, dude, it's not me. Don't we know each other better? If I had to execute my people, I wouldn't do it in such an outlandish and rageful way. I am all about efficiency and coldness. And Harry does acknowledge, yeah, we, we do know each other better than that. And this is also, again, where their wonderful banter back and back will come into play. I love their frenemy relationship as it develops throughout the book series. In book one, it's a little there, but not as present as it is later. And I think we can just bring in the laterness sooner. It's the level of banter that is just like half a step below flirting because they do know each other that well because they have gazed on each other's souls. And I want to emphasize that because I think it's endlessly entertaining. But Marcone wants this guy who is killing his people caught just as much as Harry does. And Marcone reveals to Harry that the lackey that stole Harry's hair was directly loyal to Victor Sells, one of Marcone's employees who was the wizard in charge of making the three eye. And through this, Marcone puts together that really must be him that is causing all of this trouble in the organization and killing off other people who were working in the three eye ring. Marcone theorizes that Victor Sells is likely trying to separate himself from Marcone's empire and killing off anyone who could make the three eye or tell another wizard how to make it in order to get a monopoly on this market. Marcone is angry that Harry burst into his club, all magical guns blazing, but they're still frenemies because they understand each other so deeply. After that, we get the low point of the story where Harry is very sad because he does not have any more leads to follow up on. And if he doesn't solve this case, he is going to die in many different ways. In this part in the books, he recounts some of his childhood flashbacks in a very tender way about his father and his mother and his relationship with his father. And we will also add on in the movie his relationship with magic and how he thinks his mother must have been a wizard and that he inherited his pentacle necklace from her, etc. And he'll tell all this to Susan because now we have a sounding board with her. And it doesn't have to be awkward many minute monologue voiceover. At the end of this emotionally low point moment, Harry realizes that he can probably whip up a spell to track the hair that was stolen from him, but he'll need Bob to work it out. I forgot to mention earlier when Harry's at the crime scene of Linda and decides not to, to tell Murphy anything, Murphy replies with, well, we're going to have to take you down to the station for questioning. Here's your appointment time. And if you don't show up, we will have a reason to arrest you. And Harry, busy pursuing the lead over in Marcone's club, has obviously not shown up for his questioning at the police station. So when Harry shows back at his apartment slash lab slash office to get Bob, he finds Murphy already there poking around. And Murphy, poking around in the dangerous magical paraphernalia, finds the scorpion amulet that Harry 
had taken from the abandoned ritual lake house, which comes alive, grows to be huge, and tries to kill them. During this confrontation, Harry can also yell at Murphy that he's pretty sure it's Victor Sells and she should be going on arresting him, not Harry. Over the course of this fight, Murphy gets stung with super scorpion venom and looks like she might die. So Harry bursts out of his building trying to carry both Murphy and Bob. Susan was waiting at the curb with the car because they both thought that she was just running in to grab Bob real quick. Susan calls an ambulance with her cell phone, which she has to turn on far away from Harry because cell phones don't work around him, which we could have established like in the first crime scene if we wanted to. And an ambulance is coming for Murphy. But in the distance, they hear the beginnings of the rumblings of a thunderstorm. And Harry knows that his time is ticking and he has to find this guy now. So Susan volunteers to stay with Murphy and wait for the ambulance and make sure that they know that it's scorpion venom so she can get the anti-venom. And this way Harry can go off to the climactic battle alone for further drama. Harry goes to like the parking lot of Max Pub and with Bob's help performs a tracking spell to hunt down the lost lock of hair. Morgan shows up, of course, again, as Harry is finishing the tracking spell and tells Harry that he has figured it out. Harry must be using the storm power to rip the hearts out of people and he is not going to let Harry do it again. Even if the trial is tomorrow, he is arresting Harry now. And Harry tries for a few sentences to talk Morgan down, seeing that he cannot be talked down, punches Morgan out, and quickly drives away following his tracking spell. Harry follows the tracking spell too, where Victor is about to perform the ritual to kill Harry, they have a showdown. At one point during the showdown, Harry is going to kill Victor with his magic because he is so desperate and angry and frustrated and ah! he can't handle it anymore. But in that moment, he does a soul gaze with Victor and sees how twisted his soul is from using this black magic and through that is able to choose to not use it and realize that it is not worth his life to go down that path. So character development, that is finishing up Harry's arc for this. And like in the book, Victor mostly dies as a result of his own incompetence for lighting their fighting arena on fire and also summoning demons that he didn't completely know how to control. Another note, Victor is probably seen earlier in the first Marcone intro as one of the cronies. So he's at least part of the movie a little bit before it's revealed that he's the one who's behind it all. Morgan, like in the book, saves Harry from the fire and has to acknowledge that he saw the end of the fight and saw that Harry is not the one who is doing all the evil spells justifies for Harry during the trial and the doom of Damocles is lifted. And then we can have an epilogue scene with Susan where she is patching him up, giving a debrief. It's established that Murphy has kind of forgiven Harry good enough and they are ready for more adventures in future books. And Harry and Susan are now a happy couple. So that's the movie. What do you think of it? Let me know in the comments. Now, I will acknowledge the TV show of Dresden Files, which I have seen the entirety of the one season that they made, and yes, it is as terrible as rumored. The plots are just kind of nonsensical. The characters are also like, what? There is one thing about the TV show that I think this movie could learn from, and that is the props department. Like, for example, for logistical reasons, they couldn't use Harry's iconic Beetle as the car, so they got him an old World War II era Jeep instead, and yes, they fit the aesthetic that they needed. Other things that totally fit the Harry Dresden aesthetic was making his blasting wand a drumstick and his staff a hockey stick. All of those things, yes, I like it. So whoever did the props for that show, just hire them on to do the props for the movie again. They were fantastic. But other than that, just kind of throw out everything that the show did. As for casting for this movie, I don't really care. Make sure that we have at least a few stars for blockbuster potential, but otherwise, like, it doesn't even matter. The book's main characters are almost entirely white, and I don't think we need to stick with that. Like, totally race-blind casting, whatever. As long as they're good actors, I think it'll work out just fine, and I'd be very excited to see this movie. If you are the person that Hollywood is hiring to write this script, which I hope will eventually be someone, feel free to steal all of my ideas. Thank you for watching.